many of you probably uh, have seen me here introducing speakers in the past. Um, so um, today we're a little delayed and Wynn will be back in about 10, 15 minutes. So we're going to start with our first speaker, Dr. Richard Siegel, who is the uh, director of the clinical program at the um, NIMS. And uh, in between the two speakers, Wynn will do his introduction. Oh, he's just here. So here we are. You can do your introduction right now. Pass the baton. Thank you very much. <laughs> Can you change okay. the slide? Okay. Uh, Dr. Siegel has been kind enough to bring a patient, so we're just a little bit delayed. <coughs> At any rate, uh, so I would like to begin this by just reading something to you. Uh, could you put that, the first one up? Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, those of you who will remember that we talked a little bit, a lot about Paul Ehrlich at the time when we discussed uh, sexually transmitted diseases and his great discovery of 606, the magic drug to treat syphilis for many, many years until penicillin came along. But Ehrlich was uh, one of the great founders of immunology. And it's interesting that in the 18th century, he wrote the following. We pointed out that the organism possesses certain contrivances by means of which the immunity reaction so easily produced by all kinds of cells is prevented from acting against the organism's own elements so as to give rise to autotoxins. He said if that happened, we might be justified in speaking of what he called the horror autotoxicus. Well, of course, it turns out he was right. And the body can be made to self-destruct under certain circumstances, which are the subject of today's demystifying medicine. So now we jump to the 21st century, and 22 Nobel Prizes later, all for immunology, and the essential questions kind of remain, although much has been learned along the way. And that's also part of today's demystifying session. Such things as how does immune tolerance occur? That's critically related to diseases and even in some examples of transplantation, which maybe we'll discuss later on. And it really so much has been learned about autoimmunity that the basic question is raised, what is autoimmunity? It turns out, as you'll hear, to be more complex than just that uh, name implies. So how does autoimmunity occur? Uh, if you have some marker, can you literally predict a disease many, many years before it's manifested? And are these markers cause or are they effect? Are they prognostic? Do they offer some approach to therapy? And even most recently, like yesterday, what to me was a whole new element. There's an article in Science that we'll put on the website. Can you, uh, yeah. So this is from March 1st Science, a very interesting study in which the intestinal microbiome has been manipulated and in these studies, the authors claim that it plays a role in driving the hormonally dependence, the hormone dependence of autoimmunity. This is in a model in mice, based on the idea that in general autoimmunity diseases are frequently more common in women than in men. And the last one, well, not important, there's another recent commentary that incriminates high salt in the diet as being a factor in facilitating autoimmunity and there's some experimental evidence to go along it. To me, that was reminiscent of the days when many of these autoimmune diseases, what we now call them, things like rheumatoid arthritis, all sorts of diseases that you will hear about because nobody really knew what they were called, 
And there was a fashion when they were called uh, psychosomatic diseases. There was another fashion when they were related to what was called focus of infection. So people had their tonsils taken out and so forth to help control their joint pains. So there's this whole business of a search to understand the mechanism and right in with it are therapeutic approaches because these diseases are extremely serious. So we are very fortunate to have two uh, colleagues in NIH uh, to be with us today and discuss uh, this topic. And uh, I'll briefly introduce them both to you. So the first speaker is going to be Richard Siegel, uh, who took his MD-PH degree at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, trained in medicine and rheumatology, came here, spent some time with Michael <coughs> Leonardo, whom you may remember spoke earlier uh, in this course, and is an outstanding immunologist. Uh, he's the director of the NIH MD PhD program and his official, uh, well, I don't have it. <laughs> he's the clinical director uh, of uh, NIAMS. Uh, and his research has involved uh, autoimmunity, the role of specific populations of immunocytes in the process, and so forth. And our second speaker will be Abner Notkins, uh, who graduated from Yale and got his MD at New York University, uh, did clinical training at Hopkins, came to NIH, uh, and he's fundamentally uh, a renaissance man who has worked in many areas, but most specifically in virus infections and diabetes and the relationship uh, between them. And in recent years has become really one of the leaders in thinking and doing research in this field of autoimmunity. And he coined the concept of developing a battery uh, of autoantigens that could be widely used, an autoantigen ohm, another omics, uh, to survey uh, populations at risk. And so we're very fortunate that both of these distinguished colleagues are here and are going to uh, present uh, this topic of autoimmunity. And Richard, I understand that you, uh, one of your patients is good. Maybe you. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Wynn, for inviting me, and uh, really happy to talk to you today. So we have a guest today who's one of our patients in our lupus research program and who's uh, undergone uh, some treatments here that will, and I'll introduce her in a second. And we're going to uh, talk for about 15 minutes, and then I'm going to give a general uh, talk about autoimmunity. And then Dr. Notkins, I think, is going to home in on autoantibodies, if I understand your talk right. So um, so uh, since we're going to put our guest on the spot a little bit, telling us about lupus, maybe I can just put you on the spot for a second so I understand who I'm talking to. So I guess this is a pretty diverse audience, but just sort of show of hands, who sees patients here medically trained? Okay, some, but not the majority. So I'm going to talk in, in, in more generalities. And when we have our, our patient talk, we're going to talk more about, we're going to try to stay away from jargon. And our, our patient is actually probably more versed in medicine than some of you because she's been through a lot. So why don't you come up? This is Miss Aviles. It's very uh, nice of you to come. And I guess I have, I have this microphone. And then you can hold that one. I've got, I've got one here. So anyway, so we're just going to have a talk about, about your disease. So maybe. Tell us a little bit uh, how old you are now and when you first, uh, how old you were when you first uh, were diagnosed with lupus. I'm 37 years old right now and I was 20 when I was diagnosed okay. in 1996. Okay, and um, so maybe just tell us a little bit about what was happening that you, what was happening to you that you thought um, that you went to the doctor and what you were, di um, you were diagnosed. I had a rash in my legs, they were red and they used to get hot. Mm -hmm. and, and they hurt a lot. Okay. And how long have, did that go on before you uh, saw a Like two months. Okay. 
And were you feeling well or not well with that? Was it just a rash and otherwise you're feeling well? Or I was very tired. Okay, so a lot of fatigue. And, and before 20, before that age, you were, had, you'd think, normal energy, normal childhood, didn't? A lot of energy. Right, okay. She brought me some pictures, actually. Really, it looked like your whole body changed a lot yes. um, with that. And then, uh, other, so the rash was going on for about two months, and then any other things happening uh, or along with the rash that you noticed? That was the only thing. Okay, and then at the time when you went to the doctor for that, um, did they diagnose you with lupus right away, or did it take a long time to sort of They diagnosed me right away because my mom had lupus, and she was diagnosed in 1978, and she passed in 1991. Mm -hmm. She was 38 years old. Right. So, or right away, you had a, you could, the doctors knew you had a family. I had history. it in the background, and right. they test mm -hmm. me for that right, right. away. And, and do you think, because your mom had lupus, do you think you'd gotten tested when you were a kid for that, the ANA test before you had any symptoms? No, I don't think so. Okay. One, one thing, the reason I ask that is that we know from studies of people in the military, very interestingly, I'm not going to really talk specifically about lupus today, that people have these antibodies in their blood. 10 or 20 years before the onset of disease. So there was a really nice study of military recruits because every uh, buddy that goes in the military, they get a blood test and then they went back and found people who developed lupus maybe 20 years later and those same autoantibodies were actually there before. So we kind of know in people that the, you probably had that ANA in your blood even before you got sick. Um, Okay, so you had, the, you had the rash, you got the blood test that was positive at that time, and then were you already, when they did more tests on you, were you already having other problems from the lupus at, at that time? No, it took 10 years to get um, nephritis. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so right at the beginning to treat the fatigue and the rash, you took some medicine for that? I took plaquenil and prednisone. Mm -hmm. and, and how did that do? Did that seem to help or not? That helped with the rash and the, oh, I also had joint pain. Okay. My joints used to get swelled up and very painful. Right, and that's an important thing. Lupus is our proto uh, prototypical disease. It affects almost every organ in the body, but it does affect the joints very often, and that's why we as rheumatologists see this disease that affects the kidneys, affects the skin, can affect many different organs. So, uh, so for 10 years you had that, and then tell us what happened when you uh, developed the nephritis, what was happening to you? Well, in uh, 2003, um, my blood pressure went really high, and my ankles were swelled up, mm -hmm. and I couldn't wear shoes or anything, and mm -hmm. I had a um, nephritis doctor, mm -hmm. and he gave me Cytoxin uh -huh. for six months, right. once a month. By, by vein? By vein. Okay. And it was once a month. Mm -hmm. But, and they gave me self sick and mm -hmm. that didn't work either. Right. And they referred me here. Right. So the kidney function, we talked a little bit about this, and her kidney function, which was normal before that, uh, it started getting worse. And despite these two treatments that are kind of the standard treatments for uh, lupus nephritis, kidney inflammation, things kept getting worse. And so then tell us, when you came here, uh, uh, you can tell us what, what kind of therapy When I had. came here in 2006, I was in need of kidney transplant on both kidneys. Right. So the kidney function was at a point, and that is one of the most serious consequences of lupus and what we try to prevent with the cytoxin. And in the majority of patients, that works, but in your case, it didn't work. So um, you can tell us then what happened. And I got a stem cell transplant in May 16, 2006. Right. And so that's a procedure, and we're going to talk about it at the end, where uh, we did more intensive chemotherapy uh, and gave back your own stem cells. It's an auto transplant, not somebody else's, and that's the attempt to reset the immune system. So and why don't you, we can separate things out. There were a lot of complications after that, yes. but then in terms of the lupus, tell us what happened with your kidneys and and those kinds of things that were failing before the transplant? Yes, I didn't need the kidney transplant and they're working fine right now. Right, so in terms of the lupus, we really did a reset and so that really went into remission. And let's just talk in terms of that. Any other, you guys, you had only one manifestation that we think was a new thing that happened to you. You were telling me when we talked before about your lupus. Yes, last year I had the butterfly rash, which I never had before, even when I was diagnosed the first time or, and it was after the stem cell. Right. So that was very interesting to us because this rash, which we'll show a picture of, uh, not yours, but somebody else's, is a very characteristic and often the first manifestation of lupus 
And that's actually what caused it to be named lupus. Lupus is the Latin word for wolf. And somebody thought that this very red rash looked like uh, the kind of white patches that a wolf has under their eyes. And so you had that in the wrong order. You got it all backwards. But, but yet it did, it did tell us that some element of, of your uh, disease was still there, even though very suppressed. And right now, for, your, for lupus, do you take any medicines? No, I just take uh, 10 milligrams of prednisone okay. every day. Uh -huh. So that's something that we sometimes use for that. But Plaquenil, you're not taking no. anymore? And you didn't need any more Cytoxan or no. the stronger medicines? OK. No. Now, you can tell us a little bit. This, wasn't a, this was a success in terms of lupus, but you, uh, you can just, we won't go through everything, but you were in the hospital for quite a while. And Almost two years, an right. inpatient. Right, so there were a number of complications, and I guess I'll just sort of go through it yes. briefly. So there were some, uh, you had a number of infections which needed some uh, GI, gastrointestinal yeah. surgery, and then an infection that went to your spine, and I guess that was the thing that still bothers you right now. I, um, my pig line got infected, and the infection went to the um, L4 and L5, and I couldn't walk for three months. Mm -hmm. Right. It was osteomyelitis. Right. So that was a complication, and we'll talk about this study, um, which was very successful in that five out of eight patients uh, don't have a lupus that needs medication anymore, but there were a lot of complications, and unfortunately you had some of that because you're immunosuppressed during the transplant. So right now, how would you characterize your health now? Um, good, but I still have a lot of fatigue. I always feel tired. Mm -hmm. And but I had a, I have a lot of insomnia also at night. Mm -hmm. And then your back still bothers you. My that. back still bothers me, and my right now my knees. Right. Okay. Great. And anything else you want to tell this group about lupus? That what it means to you to have had this disease? It's very hard, and sometimes um, you can look fine, but this is a quiet disease. And people sometimes tell me, like, you don't look sick or you look fine. But I only know how I go through with a lot of joint pain. And sometimes I can get up with my back pain and stuff like that. Right. So I think it, it is a disease that really, even though we have treatments that can dramatically alter the course, it really stays with people for their whole life. And, and unfortunately, your mother succumb to that disease and, and so there, it looks like your family has a, a genetic predisposition. We'll talk about that too. Okay. So, any, any, any questions from the audience? Okay. Well, thank you so much for That's sharing with us. So. So again, I, I think that was a great introduction. Thanks again uh, for, for uh, Ms. Aviles to volunteer and share that. These diseases, uh, which lupus include, are part of a larger group of diseases um, and of autoimmunity. And, and I'm going to introduce the concept. I think at NIH, where this concept was discovered, we can't not talk about autoinflammation as well. Let's see. Can you hear me with this one? I'll just one mic's enough. So, um, so in, in general, I think our challenge in understanding these diseases is how do we think about, we, we as rheumatologists and in the world of autoimmunity and autoinflammation have to deal with an enormous panoply of different clinical manifestations of disease. So this is the butterfly rash of lupus. Uh, and that you can see this is a, a sort of textbook case. You can uh, see that's one of the manifestations and, and, and uh, that, that can happen of, of skin. This is uh, the, the hand of somebody with rheumatoid arthritis. So this is an autoimmune disease that can really, as you can see, be incredibly destructive to the joints. This is somebody with type 1 diabetes who's giving themselves an insulin shot. So you can have somebody with absolutely no, uh, nothing you can see on the outside. Type 1 diabetes is a laser-like attack on the beta cells of the islets. We're going to hear about that more. Um, whereas in lupus, you can have an immune attack on almost every organ in the body. You have somebody here with a disease called ankylosing spondylitis. It's a very specific uh, disease of the spine that causes over many years fusion of the spine. You have this woman here who's in a wheelchair from multiple sclerosis. So uh, again, an autoimmune disease that can attack specifically the white matter of the brain. And then you have this person here whose toe is swollen and has gout. And that's also an inflammatory disease. But how does that fit in with all these other diseases? And that's also what I want to talk to you about today. So how do we how, what kind of, so what I'm going to tell you today are what kind of unifying concepts and mechanisms we can think about to help us understand these diseases in general. 
And, and I like to think that autoimmunity, one of the reasons I went into this and a lot of people interested in research go into autoimmune disease research is really we don't understand, despite whatever I'm going to tell you today, we don't understand a lot of the basic mechanisms of autoimmunity. We're still at a very primitive phase, I would say, compared to cancer. We understand cancer in a very deep way. We understand that this is a disease of misbehavior of genes, of somatic mutations of genes, specific genes. We understand infectious disease. These are caused by specific pathogens. In autoimmunity, we have concepts, but we don't always have uh, molecular mechanisms that can take us all the way. And it's really the interplay of a lot of different things. So it really is one of the final frontiers in medicine. So those of you out there that are interested in big medical unsolved problems, I think you have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of work to be done in this field. And that's one of the reasons we're having this lecture. So, so I think one of the first things is what do we need to understand about autoimmune diseases? One of the things as we learn from our patient, these are lifelong diseases. They tend to persist over many years, although as, as I think you've experienced, these diseases are not like this. They do have fluctuations, which we call flares. Almost all of our autoimmune diseases have that. Lupus and rheumatoid arthritis certainly do. Some diseases are so much only flares that we call them periodic fever syndromes, meaning in between the patients are absolutely fine. Um, some diseases are exquisitely targeted to one tissue type, like type 1 diabetes, where their others are systemic. Some diseases have autoantibodies that are associated with them, but some are clearly not. And some we know have nothing to do with T and B cells, but there are still diseases where the body is attacking itself just through inflammation. And those are auto-inflammatory diseases. Um, interestingly, when we started to do genetics, and I'm not going to go into the individual genes, but we found that some genes have associations with multiple autoimmune diseases. So that's the beginning of putting together some logical framework. If the same gene is a risk factor for lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and multiple sclerosis, it probably is a general autoimmunity controlling gene. We actually know some of those now. What about infection? Infectious triggers are suspected, and we'll talk about mechanistically how that can happen, but most people don't develop autoimmunity after an infection or injury. So clearly, there has to be something else. So it's really the coming together of all these different mechanisms. So, and a big question that I struggle with and I think is important to think about as a conceptual question is, are autoimmune responses just misdirected normal responses? So is this the immune system doing what it should, except the target is wrong? Are they targeting a self component versus a foreign component? Or is there something fundamentally different, a dysregulation of the whole immune system? So those are some of the things I'll talk about. Now, I know a lot of you aren't immunologists, and immunologists make up a lot of terms to try to keep people out of the field. It's sort of a little thing we do to try to keep it specialized so we can have all the fun. But I think hopefully you've, you've heard this idea before, but I want to, it's very important when you're thinking about autoimmunity, we do have to understand the normal immune system. And the normal immune system, I think, can be thought of as divided up into two different parts. You have your uh, innate immune cell, and what we mean by innate is that these cells are programmed to have certain functions. They don't see specific antigens. They can attach to specific antigen molecules like antibodies, and, uh, but they're not themselves specific except the fact that they, we now know that how they recognize pathogens are they have genetically encoded pattern recognition receptors. So these are hardwired they have receptors for bacterial components, for viral components. We now know that some of the reasons you might even make an anti-DNA antibody is that some of these cells have receptors for DNA on their surfaces or inside. And that's why these cells are important. These cells help uh, activate the adaptive immune system, which has our B and T cells whose receptors somatically rearrange. And I, I don't have time to go into all the details, but it allows these types of cells to be exquisitely specific. They can make billions of different receptor types. We also know that there are certain cells that are in between that have characteristics of lymphocytes but less restricted or less diverse repertoires of antigen receptors. And why am I putting a picture of the brain here? Uh, that's because the concept is similar to what we think of as our uh, lower brain and our more developed brain, the cortex, which has more can, the word adaptive comes from the fact that our higher brains can adapt to circumstances where our our lower brains are sort of pre-programmed to respond to give us reflexes. And so that's why people think of the adaptive immune system as layered on top of the innate immune system. Um, the other big property, which I think is maybe a cause of relapses in our diseases, is the adaptive immune system has memory. We don't have time to go into how it has memory, but 
T cells and B cells can go into a state where they can recall much quicker than their initial responses, and that's one of the reasons you have immunological memory. It's, it, it was thought originally that the innate immune system has no memory, but we, there's some interesting recent data that in the innate immune system there might be a type of immunological memory as well that could allow more rapid responses to a second challenge. And really the immune system has evolved to defend us against pathogens. Uh, you know, all you have to, if you take care of patients with immunodeficiencies, you know that the main problem with immunodeficiency, either genetic or as we, in, in the case of our patient where we induced immunodeficiency in the context of a bone marrow transplant, then you're very susceptible to infections. Um, so this is kind of where we're going to have to integrate all those concepts. And when I went to medical school, we thought of uh, autoimmune diseases on this axis. We thought, okay, they're systemic. So systemic is even in the name of systemic lupus, which can affect the skin, the joints, the kidneys, the brain, the lungs, all these different organs with autoimmune attack. Or they can be auto spe organ specific, such as all these diseases like autoimmune type 1 diabetes, autoimmune thyroid disease. There's a whole slew of autoimmune diseases where only one organ is the target. So that was the axis, and you can see that, um, that there are a number of different uh, common diseases that fall across this. Multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis are, are organ-specific, but they have systemic effects as well. Uh, inflammatory bowel disease, again, mostly uh, inflammation in the colon and, and the small intestine, but there's uh, associations with other organs as well. Um, however, what that doesn't take into account is what kind of immune response is, is going wrong. So if we think of uh, the kind of immune response that happens in lupus, we know that autoantibodies and autoreactive T cells are important through uh, animal experiments and also through uh, experiments where we've reset the immune system and, and those B and T cells go away and that can uh, get rid of a lot of the pathology that we see. However, there are also diseases where you have incredible amounts of inflammation but no evidence of autoantibodies or autoreactive B or T cells. And those diseases, this term was coined by Dan Kastner here at, because of our work in familial diseases where there's a genetic predisposition, these diseases are called autoinflammatory. So when you think about uh, in the word itself is probably misleading, we, we really uh, maybe need to come up with something else for autoimmune because the immune system encompasses these, but these are the terms we use. So when you hear about autoimmune disease, think about diseases where the T or B cells are involved and autoinflammatory diseases. Think about diseases where the innate immune system is, is the big, uh, the bad guy, so to speak. So how can we think of the general scheme of how these happen to an individual? So the way we think about it is an individual has a genetic component of innate immune responsiveness. We now know that that uh, is inherited along with genes that control this, and that's actually variable. Just like the HLA is variable, it's probably good to have genetic variability in innate immune responsiveness. Uh, so, and it's really set up to have inflammation and to be self-limiting. However, then this very important step happens where you start out with a self-limiting, nonspecific inflammation as we, all, as we would all get after an injury or an infection, but then something happens in people who develop autoimmune disease that doesn't happen in people who don't, which is this important step, loss of self-tolerance. We'll talk about immune tolerance a little bit. Once that happens, then you get into what we think of as a cycle where you have the expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines, autoantibody production, tissue damage, and a and, and very important concept is that tissue damage itself can create more autoantigens because those are released from the tissue in an inflammatory context and help essentially fuel the fire to give you more autoreactive T cells, more priming of the immune system, and that's this positive feedback loop that we think allows this uh, these types of diseases to persist. Why don't people just get a single attack of lupus and then not have another one? But that's not what we see happening. And even, in, uh, so, so, so there has to be some uh, positive feedback loop. Now, sometimes that can be through an environmental antigen. We'll talk about that or environmental factors in gout, but sometimes uh, it, there's, there's an uh, innate component there. So there's obviously modifiers. So there's genetic factors, and, and uh, such as gender. We know that women are highly predisposed to lupus, and we still don't know why. There's some interesting recent data of a number of types. There's host defense genes, which are in your genome and give you that innate immune responsiveness. We know that immune response genes have come up in whole genome scans of lupus and other autoimmune diseases. And so at this step, how responsive your T cells and B cells are also matters. 
And then, importantly, how uh, your tissue res responds to inflammation. These are all genetic factors that uh, come up when we do our, our whole genome scans and start to look at, um, at, at the susceptibility genes. Now, the other part that's really important is the environment. So we know, for instance, in rheumatoid arthritis, and at first you think this is just some kind of epidemiological quirk, but people who smoke, there are really great studies in Sweden where they track every single person in the country who gets rheumatoid arthritis, very helpful. Uh, and they found a huge signature that people who smoked had a big risk, not just one or two, but a, a very high relative risk of developing rheumatoid arthritis. And it turns out there's actually some science behind that, that cigarette smoke environmentally modifies antigens that then can be targeted in rheumatoid arthritis and fuel the fire, so to speak. UV light, our patients with lupus develop very strong sensitivity to the sun, and UV light causes changes in the skin that can then activate immune cells and we think can even trigger lupus flares. Um, infectious agents, we'll talk about how they can work. And we now know there's data that are the uh, flora in our gut can also be an important, they're an environmental factor as well. And there's some amazing data from mice that I will talk about a little bit later. Um, and then uh, farther down the chain of autoimmunity, you have these other important regulatory effects there. So can we ever counter this? It turns out their cells and the process of immune tolerance tries to rein this in control. And there's part of immune tolerance that happens during development, but there's part of immune tolerance that tries to rein this in. And that comes under the general heading of immunoregulation. So they're regulatory T cells that try to rein in T cells that make pro-inflammatory cytokines. There's mechanisms for clonally deleting T cells, which would be a great therapy if we could figure out how to harness that. And then there are ways of turning off T cells uh, and other immune cells. So that, that falls under that heading. So that's you can see we have a lot of potential tools to try to harness here to modify this final common pathway that leads to autoimmunity. So I'm just going to give some examples, and, and I won't talk a lot about autoantibodies because um, Dr. Notkins is going to talk about the lot, but I think it's important to think of mechanisms. So some diseases we know for sure, we talk about autoantibodies that are antibodies against self components, and certain diseases have the, the uh, the characteristic that the autoantibody is the disease-causing agent. So, for instance, in myasthenia gravis, a disease where patients get weakness because they have antibodies against the acetylcholine receptor, that it's an important neurotransmitter receptor, we have data, uh, you know, incontrovertible data, that those antibodies, when you transfer them to a mouse, can get a, make a mouse sick. And that's the kind of, if you think of Koch's postulates for autoimmunity, transferring the disease with an antibody is an important test to determine if that antibody is pathogenic. And, and you'll hear more about that in the second hour. So that's one kind of auto, when you think of, if you just know the immune system, you know there are T cells and B cells, there can be auto antibody mediated, B cell mediated autoimmunity, and T cell mediated autoimmunity. So this is an experiment to prove that an autoimmune disease is truly autoantibody mediated. If you do this experiment with rheumatoid factor, that's an antibody uh, IgG, IgM against IgG G that develops in a rheumatoid arthritis patient, that antibody doesn't do anything. We've known for 50 years that you can do that same transfer experiment. That antibody is a great biomarker, but it's not pathogenic. It may play a role once you have the disease in making it worse, but it's not, it can't do this. So that's an important concept. Is the antibody actually pathogenic? The, the, on the other side, how do we prove that a T cell mediated disease is pathogenic? That's a little cha more challenging because we can't take human T cells and transfer them to a mouse because of uh, uh, histocompatibility, but we can show in an experimental system, for instance, that we can produce uh, a disease that looks like multiple sclerosis and at least we can take T cells from that sick mouse, transfer them into a healthy mouse and, and get a sick mouse. So that's kind of the the way that the best we can do for a T cell mediated disease to show that the disease is actually caused by T cells. Now we have therapies that are directed against T cells. We'll talk about at the end, and that's our human experiment that we can do um, that, that can show that. Uh, we know that uh, humans can transfer. Occasionally, children of patients with lupus develop autoimmune disease. We know that's from transfer of antibodies from mother to child, and that kind of thing can happen also, uh, T cells uh, can also are, are thought to do that in certain diseases as well. But in the end, for autoimmune disease, we have to remember that T cells and B cells work together, and that's because B cells, in addition to making antibodies, they're very important antigen-presenting cells for T cells. 
And that happens in a lot of uh, different autoimmune diseases. Uh, and that is why there's a, a new therapy that was developed based on a, a cancer therapy where we deplete the B cells in the body. And that's extremely effective even in diseases like vasculitis that don't, we don't, where we don't think that the autoantibody is the only pathogenic factor. And that's because getting rid of B cells can also uh, eliminate their ability to present antigen and activate T cells because T cells get activated by recognizing antigen on the surface of other cells. So, so you can see for different diseases there's certain area diseases where we know that uh, antibodies are the main problem. So in, in, in the B cell arena, we know the an, in, in myasthenia gravis, the antibody causes disease. But there, the T cells are providing very important factors that we call T cell help for the antibody. So there's the antibody that's causing disease, but that doesn't happen in other diseases. In diabetes, um, the, the antibodies are important biomarkers, but again, they're not the, the agent that causes disease. So, so in autoimmune diseases, there's a variable contribution of T cells and B cells to the actual uh, disease. What about tissue damage? How can tissue damage actually make things worse? And, and, and this is because what, what happens is if you already have, so in all of us that don't have autoimmunity, you have tissue damage, tissue antigens are released. That's a dangerous time because those antigens are presented in the context of inflammation, which can help prime the immune system. But imagine if you have an autoantibody already in your blood. When you release these antigens, such as DNA in the case of lupus, those antigens are now not just regular antigens anymore. They, they have antibodies that are bound to them. And that can help fuel the fire, because that antigen that your body is already making an antibody to becomes uh, more immunogenic. And that can, again, cause a positive feedback loop where you can perpetuate disease. And, and in certain cases, injury can perpetuate a, a disease or tissue damage. So, so that's one of the uh, ways that you can perpetuate disease and, and you can actually broaden uh, the, the target and that's a phenomenon in immunology we call epitope spreading where you start making antibodies against one thing and then you make antibodies against a broader array of antigens that are related to the original one and we think that's partly due to this mechanism. Now to really understand autoimmunity we have to understand the mechanisms that prevent it and that's why there have been a few Nobel Prizes and major discoveries to understand immunological tolerance. And I'm just going to give you an overview of what that phenomenon is. So this is the phenomenon that really prevents us. It probably didn't evolve to have us not have autoimmunity or to have us regulate, uh, regulate uh, transplant rejection. But this is an outcome of the fact that we have very, uh, we have molecules in our body, the histocompatibility complex, that present uh, peptides to T cells and uh, other molecules to other subsets of lymphocytes. And, and, and because of that, uh, we have uh, histocompatibility, uh, incompatibility between, uh, between people. But also, we, we have to evolve a mechanism when we have that infection and tissue damage not to initiate autoimmunity every time. And also, we have to have a mechanism during development of T and B cells not to develop T or B cells that are against our own uh, self immunologically uh, self components. So, so in a, in a nutshell, there are multiple mechanisms when immune cells develop. It turns out that T cells, it's been very well demonstrated, T cells that develop that are against a component of our own bodies are actually gotten rid of in the thymus, a specialized organ where T cells develop. B cells also uh, can do that. They can also choose a different immune receptor, choose a different immunoglobulin if they're using, making a self-reactive uh, B cell receptor. However, this process is not fail-safe. And, and I uh, became interested in peripheral tolerance, partly because that's something we can manipulate. Central tolerance kind of happens once, but peripheral tolerance, meaning the things that happen after an immune cell develops, are more manipulatable. Now, peripheral tolerance Im immunologically has a number of different uh, types. So one is just the simplest one, where we call it in immunology, we like to make up these terms again, we call it immunological ignorance. That's when you have a you have a perfectly normal immune response against a component of your body, say, uh, in the brain, yet those immune cells never get to your brain. So you don't get, you don't get autoimmune disease. Now, we know in model systems in mice, if you infect the, the mouse, if you set up a system where you have a strong immune response against an antigen in the brain, then give a brain infection, you can start an autoimmune disease because you've broken that barrier that preserved this immunological ignoring of a self-antigen. You can also delete autoreactive T and B cells in the periphery, particularly T cells, and that is a process that we might be able to harness. Uh, you, can, you can get T cells to turn themselves off. And then something I'm very involved in these days 
is we know that a, a T cell and a B cell, when they start out, can become a lot of different types of cells. So cytokines, immune messengers that can influence the development of T cells, can cause what we call an older term, immune deviation. So if you can get a pathogenic T cell to become a non-pathogenic T cell, you've essentially accomplished the same thing, by you, and cytokines can be very potent at doing that. So those are some of the different ways that a, the immune system regulates itself, and you have to, studying these could help give us clues to understanding how to manipulate the immune system once you already have an uh, immunological uh, autoreactive situation to get rid of that. So, uh, sorry, I just got a little, that, that's out of order. Um, another issue is uh, another example of how damage to an immunologically privileged site can induce an autoimmune response is if you have trauma to an eye, uh, this is a classic example of what's called sy sy sympathetic ophthalmia. Trauma to an eye can cause an immune response, which can end up giving inflammation and destruction of even the eye that didn't have trauma. So that's a very dramatic example of that tissue damage phenomenon. Now, that doesn't happen in everybody, but the eye is a classic immunoproliferative privilege site at which there's a lot of immune ignorance. So when you have injury, that can break this barrier and cause reactions. But um, importantly, not only the injured eye, but even the other eye can, can be involved in inflammation. So here's a, a type of scenario where if you know that T cells can become all these different types of T cells, including regulatory T cells that negatively regulate the immune system, you can imagine that if you can manipulate that in such a way to program T cells to become regulatory T cells rather than T cells that make more destructive cytokines, that's another way of, of uh, affecting immune, immune tolerance. Um, so that's sort of an overview of, 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 of tolerance. I think it is one very important topic that I won't have time to spend. It, it could have a whole hour on this. Our, our T cells that are regulatory T cells, and that's kind of an interesting historical story. These were discovered in the 1970s cellularly. You could take uh, cells from one mouse and suppress disease in another mouse, and so they clearly were there. But then when molecular biologists started cloning T cell receptors and understanding what a T cell was, regulatory T cells seem to not have a T cell receptor and things got very confusing for a long time but here at NIH, uh, Ethan Shivak and another scientist in Japan, Shimon Sakaguchi, kind of kept thinking these cells had to be there and re-identified these cells about 10 years ago now and now it's very clear that there are a whole family of T cells that express a specific transcription factor that endows them with the property of being able to inhibit uh, effector functions of other T cells. And immediately that got people very excited in this therapeutic field. What if we could just grow more of these T cells and then we could really suppress immune responses in general? And there was human data to support that, meaning that patients who had a deficiency in, in this transcription factor, actually there's an autoimmune disease called IPEX syndrome, which uh, a genetic autoimmune disease, which results from deletion of FOXP3 and mice have a similar syndrome. The problem with this idea that we can just grow regulatory cells in culture and infuse them and cure disease is that actually if you look, for instance, in the pancreas, in the middle of a severe autoimmune destructive disease, you can actually find tremendous numbers of these um, regulatory T cells already there. So the body is already kind of hooked up, this whole system is hooked up to do this, but once you have autoimmune disease, that might have failed. So it's not clear if by just making more of these we can do that, um, but that's a very active area of disease. Um, so what about uh, at NIH, we often study very rare diseases. Lupus is a very common disease. About 1% of the population has it. But we learn a lot from diseases, and I won't go into all the details, but single gene autoimmune diseases. If you know that a disease comes from a single gene, you learn that that must be an important checkpoint in controlling immunological tolerance. And there's a whole bunch of examples uh, where you can see that where you have diseases where you have, for instance, I've studied disease called ALPS, where you have the failure of elimination of autoreactive T cells, and that causes an autoimmune disease in people that's very similar to an autoimmune disease in mice, where you actually lose the same exact gene. So that really shows that that's an, a fast that induces programmed cell death as an important checkpoint in preventing T cells from uh, becoming autoreactive. Similarly, FOXP3, the uh, regulatory T cell master regulator, when that's deleted, you get autoimmunity. Interestingly, if you think about it, these patients have normal regulatory T cells. These patients have normal FAS-induced T cell deletion. So that says that sometimes just one 
gene, and, and any time you think about these genes, the defects in this single gene must overwhelm all the other redundant mechanisms to control self-tolerance. So, and so these are very important to understand because they tell us that that's a gene that when you mutate it, that essentially trumps every other mechanism that we have. So there's a whole number of these. And, and uh, what I want to uh, introduce you to are a whole other group of diseases where this has actually told us a lot about inflammation. So these are genes that have given us insight into autoimmune disease. What about uh, diseases where you have uh, uh, insights into inflammation? And, and the story I want to tell you uh, really starts with uh, this disease, familial Mediterranean fever. This disease was known for uh, centuries. Uh, it was uh, thought to be essentially a disease that's restricted to patients in the Mediterranean basis, hence its name. These patients have arthritis, but also have uh, systemic fevers where they have fevers for three to seven days and then are completely fine, then another few weeks have another episode of fever. And uh, Dan Kastner led a team of geneticists to uh, discover that this uh, gene involved a, a, a protein called pyrin, which for a long time its function wasn't really understood. But what emerged over the next uh, the last 10 years has been that actually uh, a whole number of diseases that all involve these cyclic inflammatory cycles and various clinical manifestations, so these diseases called cryopyrin associated periodic syndromes have uh, rashes that are actually triggered by the cold in some circumstances or, or just can be spontaneous. And that involved a very important protein called NLRP3. And this protein turned out to be an important a component of a, of a cascade that involves one of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-1. And, and over the last uh, 10 years, we've actually found a whole number of diseases that all center around defects in controlling the production of interleukin-1. So we've learned from a number of different human inflammatory diseases that if you dysregulate this pathway, um, this can cause these chronic uh, periodic syndromes. Now, you might think these are just weird and strange diseases, but a huge insight happened about five years ago when it was realized, so for thousands of years, one of the oldest diseases we know about is gout, which is caused by uric acid crystals that accumulate in the body. And I was taught in medical school, well, these crystals just kind of irritate neutrophils and they make them angry, and that's why they get disease. That's not a great explanation, but believe it or not, that was about what I was taught. We now know that uric acid uh, and a number of other environmental stimuli trigger the exact same pathway. They actually activate NLRP3 to induce IL-1 secretion. So a super common disease that's caused by an environmental antigen actually triggers the same pathway as is genetically defective in all these rare familial auto-inflammatory syndromes. And again, none of these diseases involve autoantibodies. We know that we can take a mouse that gets this disease or a mouse model of this disease and we can completely get rid of T and B cells and they're just as sick. So that's the ultimate proof that these diseases are inflammation diseases, not autoimmune. Um, and that these diseases really connected it all up to interleukin-1. Now it turned out that Abbott had developed a drug for, for rheumatoid arthritis that was the interleukin receptor 1 antagonist. It had been tried, it was FDA approved, but it wasn't very effective and it turns out that once all these diseases were discovered, very quickly we at NIH and others thought, well, why don't we use this drug that's it's FDA approved for, uh, for um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Let's try it in these diseases as a test to see whether are we on the right track. Did we, is this really true? Is interleukin-1 really the key cytokine that drives that? And this was a remarkable success. So these patients with, with uh, NOMID is one of the most severe syndromes associated with NLRP3 mutations. IL-1 is overproduced. So we used the interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, and it turns out that almost every single clinical manifestation, this was done here at NIH uh, by Raphael Goldbach-Mansky with, with Dan Kastner, almost every single manifestation of inflammation that these patients were having, and they really would have these on a daily basis, went away. This is a very fast-acting drug, so these syndromes the inflammation in the eye, skin, and actually brain and inner ear, these patients go deaf from inflammation in the inner ear, and these were all stabilized very rapidly by interleukin-1 blockade. So we know that when you find the right target, and especially in a genetic disease, you can really uh, very uh, significantly affect uh, the, d the course of the disease, and this has now been used for over five years and, and with lasting success. So, so that's the simple cases, so we learn a huge amount from uh, diseases of, uh, that are rare. We learned that they're 
common diseases use those pathways. We now know this list is old. We now know that even things like in the pancreas, there's a, a protein called amylin that's secreted during diabetes type 1 and type 2, and that actually also fuels inflammation. Can, uh, people are trying interleukin-1 inhibitors for, for diabetes now based on that observation. So common diseases use these same pathways that when they're mutated cause uh, single gene diseases. So before 2007, I think everybody could really only study single gene diseases in a, in a sort of fleshed out way. And we knew for, for 20 or 30 years that there was a major role. So I told you about the major histocompatibility complex. This is a, a set of cell surface proteins that presents peptides to T cells and restricts our T cells to our uh, body and somebody else's T cells to somebody else's HLA antigens. And geneticists had known that HLA alleles were very strong uh, risk factors, so some as high as 90 time, 90 fold risk factor of having a disease called ankylosing spondylitis if you have this certain HLA allele. We now know that that might be more than just due to its function to present antigens to T cells, but other diseases have a relative risk that are relatively high. So we know that this gene is very strong, but is that the only genetic risk factor for all these diseases uh, that you can see listed here, or w how can we actually? look at the entire uh, genome and look at that. And I don't know how much has been talked about about genome-wide association studies, but this field has really been completely revolutionized since this paper came out uh, on, on, in 2007, so now about six years ago, where uh, the first large study of looking at the entire genome of individuals, these were 14,000 people, and, and the diseases they looked at were hypertension, rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes, and, and found a, a number of loci, uh, and what you can see here, these are colored. So, so the hope was that we'd find five or ten genes that would control all these major diseases. But the reality is we're up to, I can just, I'm not going to go through all the diseases, but Crohn's disease, which is, you can see here, this number tells you how genetic an autoimmune disease is. So Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease, is one of the highest. So the sibling recurrence risk, meaning if you have a, a, a brother or sister, first degree relative, that's one of the highest. Rheumatoid arthritis and lupus are low, lower, as you heard from our patient. It can run in families. Does that mean it's a Mendelian disease? No. It can be because of co-inheritance of multiple uh, uh, genes. So we know, no, uh, for better or for worse, Crohn's disease is over 100 contributory genes now. We, as we get more and more patients, the latest Crohn's disease genetic analysis pooling all the studies that have been done now over six years has shown over 100 different genetic variants are associated with Crohn's disease. We're up to about that same number for rheumatoid arthritis, about 50 for lupus, 50 for type 1 diabetes. Interestingly, other diseases like hypertension, which have a much lower sibling recurrence risk, it's much harder to find these loci. So in autoimmune diseases turn out to have a very tractable genetic uh, risk ohm, if you want to call it that. But it's not one gene, it's not two genes, it's between 50 and 100 genes. Um, does that explain all the genetic risk? You can do a calculation where you say, are all the genes we found in these genetic association studies, did that account for all the risk of a sibling getting the disease? It turns out it's only about 50%. So somewhere, the geneticists call it dark matter. There's other genetic risk that we can't figure out with this kind of technique. We know it's genetic because it affects siblings. Theoretically, a shared environmental factor could affect that as well. But we're still, that's still an, uh, something that's being actively studied. So, so now we know the real genetic predisposition. One interesting thing, now that we know the whole landscape, how good is HLA? So on these plots, I should have showed you one, HLA still stands out as the single most important risk factor in many autoimmune diseases, and in fact, we use that now as a way to say, is a disease autoimmune? If it's autoinflammatory, meaning that there's like gout or something like that with no contribution of T or B cells, HLA shouldn't uh, happen at all. And, and, and it, recently, for instance, we did a study of alopecia areata, which is a disease where hair is lost. And it was always thought to be an autoimmune disease, but very little evidence that HLA showed up as a very high risk factor. And that's telling us that that's likely an autoimmune disease because of that genetic risk. Um, some polymorphisms, there's a, a protein tyrosine phosphatase, and that can predispose to multiple diseases. That comes up, that's one of these shared autoimmune loci, and there are a number of uh, genes that have that property, and those are objects of very intense study in the autoimmunity community now to try to understand how they do that. They're not, uh, these risk factors are less than 10, so they're just small risk factors, but they're still important. 
I just want to end up talking about the environment. So we knew for many years that certain drugs can elicit autoimmune responses. So that told us that environmental factors are important. There's one called procainamide. Uh, there's some antibiotics that can do that. The mechanism isn't well established. There's some different theories of how that could happen. The drugs may react with self-proteins that might make derivatives that are immunogenic. Um, there's also autoimmunity. If we manipulate the immune system, for instance, in cancer therapy, we try very hard to get great anti-cancer T cells and infuse them back into the body. Uh, Steve Rosenberg does that here. He, he's had tremendous success with curing melanoma patients who had no other available therapies. But then, interestingly, a number of patients developed a disease called vitiligo, which is what unpigmented patches on their body. You may have, some other lectures might have shown that. That shows that we've been successful in creating a therapy that can get, can target melanocytes that make pigment, but that's now a side effect. Some of our uh, anti-cytokine therapies can also, through dysregulating immune system, do that. Now, the, the thing that's really exciting and new that, that Wynn referred to is that it had really never been thought about what, what about the environmental contribution of our own bacteria. And this is a really interesting new thing that we know in the, the paper that you talked about was, again, an animal study. So what's been realized is that many animal models, if you sterilize the intestines with antibiotics or do other manipulations, raise them in a germ-free environment, they don't get autoimmune disease models. Other autoimmune disease models get much worse when you sterilize the gut. So the whole idea that this influences autoimmunity is, is is now pretty accepted. The real huge surprise was somebody thought of this idea, what if we just take the susceptible mouse, transfer the intestinal contents to the resistant mouse? And in many cases, what happened, and this was the same as in, in this recent paper, that susceptibility can be transferred just by transferring those resident bacteria. And so what's thought to happen now is that the altered floor of the gut actually set up a reaction by the immune system that then can trigger diseases that are sometimes in the gut and sometimes outside the gut, things like uh, even type 1 diabetes type animal models. Now, the big question is, does this have anything to do with us? We don't live in cages and share our feces and do the things that mice do um, in the same way. And so it's still not clear. We know that we can transplant. There was a recent paper for um, a complication of a, of a bacteria C. difficile that you can transplant the gut flora of, one, of a healthy person to that sick person and help them resist that bacteria, but that's not an autoimmune disease. So that's still up for debate, but the fact is in a lot of our animal models, now you have to think about this as well. And uh, finally, I think I'll just uh, finish up with therapy a little bit because I think it's time for the switch. Um, how All that that I told you, that very uh, kind of superficial overview kind of hopefully got in your idea that there are regulatory pathways that we can use. And biotechnology companies in collaboration with people at NIH and elsewhere in the world have created um, through molecular biology biologics and other small molecules to try to get at that. So T cells, for instance, need not just the T cell receptor get activated, but other molecules that are called co-stimulators. And there's a whole uh, slew of co-stimulators that have been tried in different diseases. It's quite a, a imperfect science. We've cured thousands of mice with co-stimulatory blockade, but you never really know which human disease so will be the right target. And I can tell you, you can, from that example with Anakinra, it was developed for rheumatoid arthritis, but then it works in our IL-1-related inflammatory diseases. Anti-TNF turned out to be hugely, much more effective for rheumatoid arthritis, but it was evolved to treat sepsis because TNF is an important cytokine in sepsis. So co-stimulatory blockade works. There's drugs that block T cell activation that work in certain diseases. Um, the, the idea of harnessing regulatory T cells is very exciting, but that hasn't really so far panned out, partly because of this problem that regulatory T cells are already there at the site of inflammation. A very interesting therapy, again, developed to treat lymphomas that are B-cell lymphomas, so the people, biotech companies developed drugs to deplete B-cells that carry that antigen that are malignant B-cells. Again, uh, that was used in different autoimmune contexts and is now remarkably effective. The disease where it's become almost the standard of care now is vasculitis, which would never have been predicted because that's a disease of uh, immune attack on the blood vessels, but autoantibodies are not the whole story there with pathogenesis. And it turns out that this antibody doesn't get rid of autoantibodies, but gets rid of the B cells that are at a stage before they actually are at an antibody secretion stage. So that's a, a drug that is effective in RA, but vasculitis as well. It's been tried in lupus. 
and that's this B cell depletion therapy. And finally, uh, t blocking cytokines has been remarkably effective. TNF uh, is one of those cytokines, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, and ankylosing spondylitis. So three of the diseases I showed you at the beginning, uh, TNF blockade is effective in. What about the ultimate therapy? So what our, our, our guest uh, uh, underwent. If nothing works, I think when you're at risk of losing an organ, it's worth thinking about. We do bone marrow transplants again for malignant diseases. What about resetting the immune system? So the therapy that, that our patient went, underwent uh, was a therapy that involved B cell depletion, T cell depletion, and the cytoxin drug that we use, but at higher doses than we use to treat nephritis. Stem cells were harvested, and this is a technology that was developed from the cancer field, and then were given back to the patient after this intensive regimen with the intent, essentially, of resetting the immune system. And certainly, in diseases where um, there's, uh, this has worked very well in malignant diseases and in immunodeficiencies to essentially uh, what then you do a transplant from another person. But the idea here is not to have graft versus host disease because that can cause complications similar to lupus, but to take a person's own stem cells. So that's the, the therapy. Um, and, and I just, I, I, I was going to show the, the outcomes, but basically five out of the eight patients treated with this therapy uh, responded very well, like uh, Ms. Aviles are no longer on anti-lupus medications or high doses of them. Um, however, four out of those eight patients had very severe complications such that you went through and, and two ultimately passed away of those complications. So I think I want to end with the idea that we need to do better. We have therapies that, experimental therapies that can work in, in very uh, difficult cases, but we clearly want to modify. So this protocol really has, we're not doing this protocol anymore, but we're trying to figure out ways to do stem cell therapy without as much immunosuppression. And there are a number of centers around the country that are doing uh, those kind of, you know, of studies right now. So anyway, I wanted to leave you with that. I hope that was uh, got you. You're basically just wetting your appetite is the idea here in terms of the world of autoimmune and inflammatory diseases. So, thanks. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Richard, for introducing us to the brave new world. Uh, I, I want to uh, bring to your attention that all of the PowerPoints and references and some notes that I've written are all on our website, not only for this session, but for all sessions of the course for the past 11 years. So all you have to do is Google demystifying medicine, and you can see a lot of this, which uh, is, you know, you can't assimilate just by <laughs> looking at in fast version, but you'll have a chance to uh, think it over. So now I think we'll hold questions till after uh, Abner's talk, okay? Well, I'm going to uh, talk today about antibodies uh, that react with self-antigens uh, and uh, uh, auto and compare auto antibodies versus polyreactive uh, antibodies. Now, um, you heard a very good presentation from uh, Richard about the classification of autoimmune uh, diseases and with emphasis on lupus. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, primarily type 1 uh, diabetes. And this is a uh, section of the pancreas, uh, and this is the acinar cells which make the digestive juices, and this is the islets of Langerhan, and within the islets are the beta cells which secrete insulin, and insulin, of course, is required to uh, regulate the blood glucose level in the body. Here is a section of pancreas from a mouse that has uh, autoimmune type 1 diabetes. And what you can see is this massive infiltration of inflammatory cells, B and T cells, into the islets, which results in the destruction of these beta cells. And as a result of that, you have hypoinsulinemia and hyperglycemia, or the development of diabetes. Now the question is, what are these B cells and T cells seen? 
what is the antigen to which they're reacting? Uh, and um, to try to determine this, uh, some time ago, we had developed a, a beta cell uh, subtraction library and succeeded in isolating five novel genes, two of which, IA2 and IA2 beta, um, it turned out to be major autoantigens in type 1 diabetes. IA2 is a protein about 979 amino acids in length. It has a cytoplasmic domain, a transmembrane domain, and what we call a luminal domain. And the reason is because this is a transmembrane protein on dense core vesicles. And dense core vesicles are the vesicles uh, which contain uh, hormones such as insulin uh, and neurotransmitters. So this is, is a transmembrane protein on these dense core vesicles. By sequence, it's a member of the th um, protein tyrosine phosphate family, except it has two substitutions in this region, which makes it essentially enzymatically inactive. But it's still a protein structurally that is a transmembrane protein on dense core vesicles. Now, once we had the sequence uh, of this uh, gene, uh, we then uh, developed a very sensitive radio immunoassay and screened hundreds of patients with type 1 diabetes. And what you can see is about 70% of these patients developed autoantibodies to IA2. As compared to the control, it was just several percent. Now, there are other autoantibodies associated with diabetes, and one of them is glutamic acid decarboxylase. So here's what I just showed you with IA2. And antibodies to GAD were found in about the same percentage. But what was particularly interesting is that many of these patients that had autoantibodies to IA2 did not have autoantibodies to GAD. And many that had antibodies to GAD did not have autoantibodies to IA2. But if you look for both antibodies to IA2 and GAD, close to 90% of the newly diagnosed patients with type 1 diabetes had one or the other or both of these antibodies. So the question was then, when do these antibodies first appear? This was in subjects at the time of diagnosis. Do they appear before the development of the disease? And so what we did was sort of a classic long-term prospective retrospective study in collaboration with Noel McLaren, who was then at the University of Florida, and looked at about, I think there were close to 10,000 subjects in this uh, study, and uh, none of them had diabetes at the onset. Blood was drawn, and then samples were collected, and these subjects were followed out uh, over about 10 years' time. Then, when an individual came down with type 1 diabetes, we went back and took out these samples and looked to see when these autoantibodies first appeared. And what we found is that many of them appeared years before the development of type 1 diabetes. And the next study uh, shows you, and I think is a summary of what we found and what a number of other groups uh, have uh, found uh, doing similar types of studies. If you have one of these autoantibodies, the likelihood of developing type 1 diabetes in five years' time is 10% or less. If you have two autoantibodies, the likelihood of developing type 1 diabetes in five years is about 50%. And if you have three autoantibodies, it's about 60 or 70%. Thus, these autoantibodies appear years beforehand. They're predictive. The more antibodies you have, the more predictive it is that you're going to develop the disease. So this type of approach now with type 1 diabetes is used in clinical research laboratories to identify high-risk subjects with the ultimate goal of entering these subjects into therapeutic intervention trials with hopes that you could prevent the development of the, di of the disease long before you develop clinical symptoms. Now, what about type 2 diabetes? Type 2 diabetes is a very different disease. About 90% of the subjects of um, patients who have diabetes have type 2 diabetes. But we looked at about uh, 
1,200 or so patients with type 2 diabetes, and we found 2 to 3 percent of these had autoantibodies to IA2. Uh, other laboratories have found a little bit higher percentage, 3 to 5 percent, and we found about 5 to 8 percent had autoantibodies to GAD. Well, what does this mean? Because type 2 diabetes is not an autoimmune disease. What it means is that some of these patients have an autoimmune component. If you take a conservative number of, say, 5%, and considering there are 20 million people who have type 2 diabetes, that would be, if it was 5%, that would be 1 million subjects that have either been misdiagnosed and really have type 1 diabetes or have some combination of type 1 and type 2 diabetes. But these patients uh, who have these autoantibodies are generally referred to as LATA, latent autoimmune diabetes of adults, or type 1.5 uh, diabetes. And I think the question now uh, is, uh, should patients with type 2 diabetes be screened uh, for these autoantibodies? Um, and uh, uh, if they are screened, uh, would it change your therapeutic approach? Would you start these patients on insulin sooner uh, than you would otherwise? And so this uh, has a number of pros and cons, which I won't go into, but it's a, a subject that is, uh, has been and is widely debated in the diabetes community. Now, here is a list of, of some of the diseases, about a dozen of the diseases, some of which Richard mentioned, uh, of uh, uh, autoimmune diseases, and here are some of the autoantigens that are known to be associated with these diseases, and you have autoantibodies to a number of these uh, autoantigens. And what has been found out is in the, uh, about a half a dozen or more of these diseases have been studied, is that these autoantibodies appear years uh, before the development of clinical disease, just like in type 1 uh, diabetes. And uh, uh, what this means is that many of these diseases are chronic diseases. They appear years before there's clinical manifestations of the disease. And in uh, several of these diseases, people have also looked to uh, see whether these autoantibodies were predictive. And Dr. Siegel mentioned uh, lupus, for example, where they find these autoantibodies um, five to ten years before the development of the disease. The number of studies, though, and the size of the subjects is relatively small as compared to what the diabetes community has done. But the question now is, could these antibodies be used as predictive markers, uh, especially if we can get more data on this? And if they could be, then could you enter them into therapeutic intervention trials to try to prevent the development of the disease? Now, let me switch from, from uh, um, autoantibodies to polyreactive antibodies. And uh, uh, let me tell you how we got into this. Uh, a number of years ago, we were trying to determine whether viruses could trigger uh, autoantibodies. And so what we did was we took a virus, real virus, and we um, infected mice with this. And we found that there were a number of uh, autoantibodies, or there was autoantibodies in the serum, uh, that reacted with a number of perfectly normal tissues. Problem was that the um, uh, titer of these antibodies was very low, it was very hard to study, so we decided to make hybridomas. And we made a number of hybridomas, and we found, to our great surprise, uh, that a, a monoclonal uh, uh, hybridoma produces just a single type of antibody that when screened against a variety of tissues it reacted uh, not with just a single tissue or a single organelle but this antibody is, which is a single antibody reacted with all these various organs and they reacted with different organelles in these organs and very detailed studies showed that this wasn't just cross reactivity they were recognizing uh, different antigens. Now, uh, we were very excited about this. Um, I thought that maybe viruses were really were a major trigger, 
Uh, and the, but then we did an experiment which we should have done six months before we did this experiment. And we took normal mice and we did the same thing. And we made the hybridomas from these normal mice. And what we found was essentially the same thing, that many of these mice produced many hybridomas that were polyreactive, that could react with a variety of tissues. And, most, and all these uh, hybridomas were slightly different in terms of their tissue reactivity. But in other words, what it showed is that, that these polyreactive antibodies were part of the normal repertoire, the normal B cell repertoire of the animal. Now, to study it in more detail, uh, what we used was we selected about a half a dozen different uh, antigens, somewhat randomly. And by ELISA, uh, here's a single monoclonal antibody, 2E4. And what you can see, it can react to varying degrees with beta-gal, single-stranded DNA, insulin, thyroglobulin, etc. In marked contrast to that, is a monoclonal antibody that we made against beta-gal. And this was a monoclonal monoreactive antibody. It just reacted with beta-gal. It did not react with any of these other antigens. So this is the fundamental difference between a polyreactive antibody and what I call a monoreactive antibody. Polyreactive antibodies being able to react with many different antigens the monoclonal monoreactive with just a single antigen. Now, once we found this, we uh, studied in some detail the properties of these polyreactive antibodies. And what we found is that these polyreactive antibodies could react with a variety of structurally unrelated antigens, proteins, bacteria, DNA, phospholipids, while the monoreactive was just a single cognate antigen. The affinities were low. The association constants of 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 7. Well, it was high with the monoreactive antibodies. Many of these genes were germline or near germline. Well, these were hypermutated. And many were IgM, but also IgA and IgG. Well, there was representation of all three types with the monoreactive. And when we injected these polyreactive antibodies into animals, the half-life was much shorter than with a monoreactive, presumably because they were reacting with a variety of different uh, organs and tissues. So how do um, polyreactive antibodies uh, really work? Uh, the classic immunochemical idea has been the lock and key hypothesis. And that is that you have um, a, a, an antibody uh, that has a very specific type of, of uh, structure. Uh, and you have an antigen that also has a very specific structure. And the two interact like a lock and key to give a very, very specific reaction. Well, what we think now is, and there's evidence for this, is that the antibody binding pockets are far more flexible than we've thought in the past. And I sort of think of these polyreactive antibodies in more like a pass key. And here is the uh, antigen binding pocket for an, uh, an antibody, the antibody binding pocket. Uh, and here are uh, four different antigens. And what you can see is, uh, based upon our idea of the conformational hypothesis, that this antigen can recognize these residues, while this one recognizes these residues, this one these residues, et cetera. And it could explain then why uh, a polyreactive antibody can bind so many different antigens, uh, but with a, a much lower affinity uh, than a lock and key hypothesis of a monoreactive uh, type of antibody. Now, not only do, um, does the antibody, the purified antibody, bind these antigens, but the B cell that makes these uh, antibodies can also bind a variety of antigens. And this shows you, this is a marker just for B cells. And you can see here that beta-gal and thyroglo beta -gal and insulin both bound uh, to this. Here's the merger. So these are two different antigens binding simultaneously uh, to a single B lymphocyte. 
Harris thyroglobulin and beta gal binding simultaneously to a single B lymphocyte, thyroglobulin and insulin. And here is a case where we have three different antigens binding to the same B lymphocyte at the same time. Now, it, we, um, um, I've talked just about polyreactive antibodies, but we're beginning to think that monoreactive antibodies, the classic type of antibodies, uh, may also have a certain degree of polyreactivity or at least oligoreactivity. So in collaboration uh, with uh, Dr. Stephen Johnson at Arizona State, he has these chips which have 10,000 peptides on them. There are 17 amino acids long, each of these, and it's a random type of chip. And we took a, one of our polyreactive antibodies, and this is sort of the cutoff point, and this is the signal intensity. And you can see this polyreactive antibody bound to a whole variety of these peptides. That wasn't a surprise to us, but what was more surprising here was a monoreactive antibody that we thought reacted specifically with uh, a particular bacteria. And what you can see, it also could bind to a lower degree, but it could bind also to a number of different peptides. And so what this really shows is that um, if you screen against enough antigens, 10,000 antigens, that classic antibodies, so-called monoreactive antibodies, can have a sort of polyreactive type of properties. Now, let me uh, talk a little bit about uh, poly, uh, that, uh, the protective value of polyreactive uh, antibodies. Um, but first, let me say a few words uh, about natural antibodies. Natural antibodies have been known for over 100 years. And they've been an enigma because they're present in newborns, they're present in germ-free animals, uh, and they can react with a number of antigens to which the host has never been exposed. And so how, how do you um, explain this? Uh, and um, uh, previously, we showed that uh, uh, in humans, uh, about, I think, probably close to 50% of the B cells in the cord blood were able to make polyreactive antibodies. And in the adult peripheral circulation, about uh, 15 to 20 percent of the B cells could make polyreactive antibodies. So polyreactive antibodies uh, are a major component of the natural uh, antibody repertoire. Now, it's also been known for many years uh, that natural antibodies uh, can react with a variety of different bacteria and viruses uh, to which they've never been exposed. So our hypothesis was that one explanation for these natural antibodies were that, in fact, the majority of them were polyreactive antibodies. And they didn't have to be exposed uh, to a particular antigen. They existed in the repertoire. They could bind to many different things. So to study this, uh, we chose a half a dozen, uh, or rather a dozen different um, bacteria, gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. And we used one of our monoclonal monoreactive antibodies. And you can see here uh, very strong uh, binding uh, to these uh, E. coli bacteria. But the same antibody, this monoreactive antibody, did not bind to any of these other bacteria. Now, I'm going to show you a polyreactive antibody, which is just the opposite. And here is a single polyreactive antibody. And you can see it binds to a very high degree to these bacteria, moderately to these, and to a rather low level uh, to these particular uh, bacteria. Now, the next question we asked was whether complement um, could bind uh, to these polyreactive antibodies. Now, for those of you who aren't immunologists, uh, complement is a uh, very important component 
of the natural or innate immune repertoire. Uh, it's a collection of uh, uh, several different uh, proteins, and it binds to antigen-antibody interactions. And when it does that, it cleaves certain products that it can have chemotactic effects or that can actually lyse cells. So the question we asked is the binding affinity of polyreactive antibodies strong enough when it binds to an antigen to fix complement? And the answer is yes. And here was, we show the binding to a particular bacteria. And you can see that it was about 90% binding of the complement to this particular bacteria versus the control. So clearly, complement could bind. Now, if that was the case, <clears throat> we asked, what effect would it have on the growth of the bacteria? Because I said when you have an antigen-antibody interaction and complement, which can have a lytic effect on a number of things, uh, what effect will this have on the growth of these bacteria? And so we pulse labeled uh, tritiated thymidine. And here is PBS over time. This is the growth of the bacteria. And this is our monoclonal monoreactive antibody. Did not inhibit the growth. But here now is our polyreactive antibody. And you can see that it markedly inhibited the growth of these bacteria. So it has a protective effect. And if you heat and activate the complement, you lose this effect. So you need both the polyreactive antibody and you need the complement. And the complement also generates a number of these factors that I mentioned, chemotactic type of factors, one called C5A, four different bacteria. And you can see in every case when you had the polyreactive antibodies versus the monoreactive antibodies, it generated this factor. And these factors then can play a role in phagocytosis. And so here we took bacteria, labeled them green, took macrophages, labeled them red. And what you can see is there is a, a very strong uptake by these macrophages of the bacteria. Here's the actual curve. And here uh, is, this is with our polyreactive. And here is our monoreactive. And you find very, very little uptake. So the polyreactive antibodies now can enhance phagocytosis. And yet, this is an antibody that reacts with self-antigens. Now, what about in human sera? Um, it, uh, can we identify polyreactive antibodies? So what we do is we take um, purified human IgM, we pass it through a beta gal column, uh, collect uh, the pass through, and then elute what's there. And if it's polyreactive, we said, then it should also bind to a thyroglobulin column. Did the same thing, collected the LU8, collected the pass through, took the LU8, passed it now through a third column, a single stranded DNA column, collected the pass through in the LU8. And what we thought was if it passed through all these three columns, it must be a polyreactive antibody. And so we took the, the pass-through and concentrated it to the same extent as the uh, polyreactive IgM, and then asked, will it bind to bacteria? And what you see is that the polyreactive enriched bound very well, while the polyreactive depleted serum, human serum, did not. And as a result of that, it could polyreactive enriched could lyse bacteria, while the polyreactive depleted could not. Now, to summarize what I've said so far, that the polyreactive antibodies bind to a variety of bacteria. They fix complement. They inhibit bacterial growth. They lyse bacteria through the classic complement pathway. And they enhance phagocytosis of bacteria by macrophages. And I didn't go into this, but they can neutralize endotoxin. And the conclusion from this is that polyreactive antibodies are a major component of the natural antibody repertoire and provide an explanation, at least in part, for the broad antibacterial activity of normal serum. Now, <clears throat> believe it or not, I'm going to get back to autoantibodies in a few minutes, but I just want to show you one more uh, set of slides. 
And that is, we've recently found uh, that uh, another protective effect of these polyreactive antibodies, and that is uh, the uh, ability uh, of them to bind to uh, and clear or phagocytize apoptotic cells. It's um, estimated that in the human body, about a billion cells a day undergo phagocytosis. And uh, it's thought to be very important to uh, uh, phagocytize or clear these cells. Uh, otherwise, they're thought to play a role in triggering certain autoimmune diseases. And they are thought to play a role uh, if they're not cleared properly uh, in, in lupus. Now, um, we therefore uh, hypothesize that it may really be the polyreactive antibodies that were playing a major role in the clearance of these apoptotic cells. And so to study this, and these slides are a little bit more complicated. Uh, these, and this is new data, and I haven't put together simple slides yet. But what we did was we took these um, uh, cells, human T lymphocytes, and we treated them with UV light, and that induces apoptosis. And the way you can tell is by the binding of an exon V5 and also by the permeability of the cell. So what you see is that at zero time, only 12% of the cells are apoptotic. But within 20 uh, uh, minutes, about 98% of the cells are apoptotic. And then what you, show, you see here is that the polyreactive antibodies bind to the apoptotic cells. But the uh, monoreactive antibodies do not. So polyreactive antibodies then are binding to these cells. And what we then did was what we call gating these uh, cells into uh, live cells, early apoptotic and late apoptotic. Uh, this is uh, a, a, a normal situation in a live cell. You can see early in apoptosis the annexin 5 binding and late in apoptosis even more and the PI, which is an index of uh, permeability. And then we ask, what happens to the binding of a monoreactive antibody versus three polyreactive antibodies? And what you can see with the live cells, nothing bound. Then you look at early apoptosis, and the, the monoreactive didn't bind, and you got a, a small amount of binding of the polyreactive. But look what happens in late apoptosis. The monoreactive doesn't bind, but you get anywhere from 40 to 80 percent binding uh, of the polyreactive antibody. And this simply shows where in the cell it's binding. This is a marker for the membrane, and this is our antibody, 2E4. DRAC is a marker for the nucleus. And what, here's a single cell, and what you can see is in this cell it's binding to the nucleus. We find that in about 8% of the cases. Here, you see the antibody is binding to the membrane of the cell. And here, uh, you can see uh, it's binding to the cytoplasm of the cell. So the polyreactive antibodies are getting into the cells when they become permeable, and they combine to a variety of different antigens. And, um, it also generates, I won't go into this, it also generates, as you would expect, as I showed you with bacteria, C5A, uh, and it fixes complement. And it enhances phagocytosis. And uh, here is our, and the uh, quadrant to look at is the upper right-hand quadrant. And uh, only 6% of the cells are uh, uh, phagocytized here. Uh, and about the same percentage was a monoreactive and the same percentage with a polyreactive in the absence of complement. If you put complement in, as you can see, there's about a four to five fold increase in the phagocytosis. And then what I just want to show you is that um, phagocytosis, that uh, rather apoptosis, can be induced by a number of things, by viral infections and other types of infections. And here, for example, we infected cells with HIV. And what you can see here is that the uh, polyreactive antibodies, but not the monoreactive, three polyreactives, all bound to the HIV infected cells, nothing bound to the uninfected cells. And then it enhanced uh, the uh, 
phagocytosis of these uh, cells. And l let me show you how we do that. Uh, it's a very nice technique called image stream. Image stream is a uh, flow through cytometry. But what it does is it takes a picture of every cell. And it, with a, a powerful software program, it's able to tell how far apart these cells are. So here is a T cell, which we would make, say, apoptotic. And here is the macrophage. And we want to know, will it be phagocytized? And so the software program, through the pictures, can determine how far apart they are. And so here now is an example of full phagocytosis. And you see the distance between these colors is very small. And here is partial phagocytosis. Distance is greater. And here is what we call just adherence and the distance is greater. And the software program can give you absolute numbers and tell you to what degree phagocytosis has taken place. And here is an example of that uh, with our HIV-infected T cells. And uh, this, again, uh, is a, a single uh, uh, um, cell. And what you see is the macrophages are in red. The T cells are in uh, uh, green. Uh, and what you can see, you have full phagocytosis. We found this in about 41% of the cells that were phagocytized. And here, in about 35%, you have partial phagocytosis. And here, uh, you have what we call adherence. And so by this method, you can really quantitate the degree of phagocytosis that's taking place. So to summarize now, what I've said, the polyreactive antibodies are a major component of the natural antibody repertoire. The broad antibacterial activity of the natural antibody repertoire is largely due to polyreactive antibodies. Polyreactive antibodies bind to apoptotic cells and accelerate their phagocytosis by macrophages and complement. And polyreactive antibodies have protective properties uh, against uh, foreign invaders and against the host's own damaged cells. Now, why did I go into so much detail about polyreactive antibodies? Because now I want to compare polyreactive antibodies, which bind to self-antigens, with autoantibodies. So what is the difference between an autoantibody and a polyreactive antibody? They both bind to self-antigens. Is there any real difference? Because most autoantibodies are sort of defined by virtue of the fact that they bind with self-antigens. But what we're saying here is that there are millions of antibodies in the body that can bind to self-antigens. So what is the uh, real difference? I think of it uh, by analogy sort of like the color red. Uh, and red has a number of different shades, and it has a number of different flavors. And so it is with antibodies that react with self-antigens. Uh, so um, autoantibodies are associated with disease. Polyreactive antibodies are not associated with disease, even though they bind to self-antigens. The uh, autoantibodies have a high affinity, while the polyreactive antibodies have low affinity. Autoantibodies are generally somatically mutated, while the polyreactive are germline or ger near germline in configuration. The polyreactive antibody, uh, autoantibodies are primarily IgG, polyreactive mainly IgM, but also IgG. And the autoantibodies are part of the adaptive immune system, uh, which Dr. Siegel talked about. And the reason we say that is because uh, we think it's antigen driven because they have so many somatic mutations. So we think that these real autoantibodies are uh, antigen driven, while the polyreactive antibodies are part of the natural antibody repertoire or the innate repertoire. And finally, the autoantibodies may be pathogenic or non-pathogenic. Uh, in fact, 
probably the majority of the autoantibodies or antibodies associated uh, uh, with disease uh, do not have a known pathogenic role. They're there, but we don't know what they do. In contrast to uh, what Dr. Siegel mentioned, the antibody, uh, for example, in myasthenia gravis, which is clearly a pathogenic antibody. So, um, Uh, I would, as a result of this conclusion, what I would say is that the term uh, autoantibody should be used in a very restricted way. It should be used in a, uh, uh, by a medical sense. It should be used only when associated with disease. I would not use the term autoantibodies. Uh, to describe uh, any antibody uh, that uh, simply reacts with self-antigens. I don't consider that really uh, what I would define as an auto-antibody. Uh, and um, uh, I think it's clear then from this that there are now millions of antibodies that can react uh, with uh, self-antigens uh, but just like the color red, where there are different uh, flavors to it, uh, the uh, autoantibodies and polyreactive antibodies uh, differ from each other in terms of uh, their, where they're associated uh, and uh, their properties uh, and uh, their actual uh, functions. So I think uh, we need a redefining or a clarification of the term autoantibodies, and I would use that term in a very specific sense and not apply to all these other antibodies that can react with self-antigens. Now, the work that I've described was carried out over the years in collaboration with a number of colleagues, and the principal one in the uh, work on the protective effects of antibodies was Joe Zoe, who's sitting out there. Joe, raise your hand. <laughs> and Joe has done most of the work uh, on that. Uh, and uh, uh, if you have any uh, questions, I would be glad to uh, try to answer them. several questions. So um, these autoantibodies, they are not polar reactive. To, to summarize, they, they are not polar reactive antibodies. Polar reactive, yeah. So we ju you just showed us the polar reactive antibodies. So the autoantibodies, they can't be polar reactive. Is that right? And the, the word you're using. There's, there's a fun, she's asking if there's a fundamental difference between autoantibodies and polyreactive antibodies. Yes. Antibodies can move between those. Uh, yeah, could uh, the autoantibodies be polyreactive antibodies? Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a great debate about where these autoantibodies originate whether some of them can originate from these polyreactive antibodies or not. And there's no clear answer to this right now. There are um, some papers that suggest maybe uh, some of these polyreactive antibodies can originate from these polyreactive antibodies. But there are other papers that suggest that isn't absolutely necessary. You can explain it in other ways. Well, but you didn't check that by yourself. You can't really uh, say that. No, I mean, you have to. Uh, uh, those are very difficult type of experiments to be able to do uh, mm -hmm. to see where these antibodies came from. Because you see, most of these autoantibodies are somatically mutated. In other words, their uh, genes are different than the polyreactive antibodies. So you would have to be able to show that the polyreactive antibodies became mutated 
uh, into an autoantibody, and you would have to show what the uh, gene sequence was on these things. So that's not easy to do. All right. Um, yeah. Sure. Uh, well, about this phagocytosis, uh, a very interesting issue. Did you check those who were adherent to phagocytosis, like the 17 percent, why they escape this uh, phagocytosis? Do you know the mechanism now? Um, the, the mechanism is, as I say, is that the, the uh, host ha has to clear these apoptotic uh, cells, and we think that this is one of the normal mechanisms uh, by which it does. In, in the past, people described it in terms of just uh, natural antibodies aid in the clearance of these cells. But what we're saying is it's not just natural antibodies, it's the polyreactive antibodies in the so-called natural antibody repertoire that are one of the main factors. Okay, thank you. So while we're getting another question, so Abner, do people who have uh, autoantibody real disease, <laughs> do they express uh, polyreactive antibodies? Sure. I mean, and polyreactive antibodies are, again, part of the uh, normal repertoire. Uh, they express them. One of the things that we're looking at now uh, is to see if there is a higher increase uh, or not of polyreactive antibodies in people who have uh, various autoimmune diseases. And we're uh, just beginning to, to, uh, to look at that. Um. Let's see, this is a complex question. Let me, let me break it down into two simple questions. Are the terms environmental factors and epigenetics used simultaneously? I think you, you could, um, uh, uh, an environmental factor you, might you induce an epigen epigenetic alteration. Yeah, the first speaker mentioned environmental factors such as viruses and medication. Right. But how how broad are environmental factors with respect to how they work on genes, how they affect gene behavior? Well, I mean, in terms of diseases, uh, as you heard him say, that there have been a, a, an enormous amount of speculation what may trigger the autoantibodies, like in the viruses and like the bacteria uh, and molecular mimicry and a variety of other techniques. You're asking more specifically then, does that environmental trigger, whatever that is, uh, affect uh, the epigenetic aspect of the gene? And I don't think th that's known in connection with autoimmune diseases at this point. Because well, we're not certain what the triggers the, are. The answer to your question is the epigenetic is not the environmental factors, the it's of it. Okay, Help. I still don't get the difference between environmental and epigenetic. Um, <laughs> whether a, uh, let's say a gene or a protein is sulfated, which would make it more active in some process, is an epigenetic event. But whether the sunshine causes that Patient reaction to occur is environment. Okay. Um, I was just curious if you had any ideas about why these autoantibodies are pathogenic as opposed to the polyreactive antibodies being non pathogenic. As I, uh, as I mentioned, and I think uh, Rich mentioned this also, is that perhaps the majority of these autoantibodies that are associated with disease, um, it's not known what role they actually play in the pathogenesis. For example, IA2, which we've studied extensively, uh, it's an excellent marker for type 1 diabetes. It may be one of the best markers for type 1 diabetes. But what role it plays in the pathogenesis of the disease and how it contributes to the pathogenesis is is uh, 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 unclear. We know quite a bit now about the function of that uh, of that particular gene, uh, but um, we don't know how the antibody interacts in any way to cause the disease itself. So many of these are what they call biomarkers, these antibodies, and they don't know how they cause disease. 
with myasthenia gravis and several others, it's known because they bind to the receptor for, say, acetylcholine. And so clearly that is pathogenic, uh, but the majority of them it still isn't known. So, ah, well, we're getting another question. What about the question of bacterial memetics? Uh, <laughs> is that the word? Yeah. The Micro. What? The uh, papers that appeared recently, you mean? No, 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 no. The, the concept that autoantibodies bear relationship to bacterial proteins on their surfaces and expression. Uh, what, do, you, do you mean by molecular right mimicry that. type of things? I, I mean, there's a whole concept that uh, called molecular mimicry yeah. where they think that certain viruses or certain bacteria, you may make antibodies to those, and those antibodies then can cross-react with host antigens or host tissues. Uh, there's some evidence for molecular mimicry in animal models, uh, a little bit harder to prove at the human level. So are there any human uh, autoimmune diseases where that seems to be? Uh, I don't know if there's any that one uh, would absolutely say is due to molecular mimicry. They're able to show that the antibodies to some of these viruses can cross-react uh, with normal human tissue. But again, whether it's involved in the pathogenesis is not clear. Hi. Um, uh, this is a very uh, basic question. But for example, when you talked about the rheumatoid factor earlier, mm -hmm. it is an IgM antibody. Mm -hmm. uh, it is associated with disease, but not pathogenic for the disease. Mm -hmm. So do I still call it an auto anti? It's you know, fits half your criteria, but not all of them. By my definition, which I'm not sure most of the uh, immunologists would, would agree with, um, uh, because most of them think that anything that reacts with self should be called an autoantibody. Uh, I do not think that's the case anymore based upon all the evidence we have with these polyreactive antibodies. Uh, but uh, uh, it's an IgM uh, antibody. and. Uh, uh, we don't know what role it plays in the pathogenesis of the disease. I mean, the point is, I, I think Rich said uh, they, clearly that th there's no definite evidence in terms of its pathogenic role. People have looked this, for this for the longest time. It's, it is a, 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 perhaps a useful marker as a predictor, although not a, a particularly good one because a lot of patients uh, have uh, rheumatoid, fa anti rheumatoid factor but don't have rheumatoid arthritis. So, so um, these uh, polyreactive antibodies, when um, when they uh, enhance phagocytosis, um, you know, I'm not an immunologist, so this is maybe a naive question, and you get uh, digestion of, let's say, pathogen bacterium, um, does that um, do those uh, uh, digested bacterial products? Are they now uh, presented to the adaptive immune response, or uh, ad uh, adaptive immune response, or, or do they bypass that and just get digested completely? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I can give you a, a direct answer to uh, uh, to that question. I mean, but clearly, what you need uh, is uh, uh, both the adaptive immune response and the innate uh, immune response. The innate immune response, or the polyreactive antibodies alone uh, don't seem to be capable of eliminating a disease. You need the adaptive immune response that would be much more specific to a particular bacteria uh, or virus. But what I think is clear is that these polyreactive antibodies can help and contribute uh, to, uh, to the process. OK, thank you. All right, well, thank you very much, Abner. That okay. was, uh, Wonderful. That was a Tyler great Wacken. insight. Thank you all. Can I remind you about the website and everything is there. All the